Hey, good morning, Silver City Church. Great to be with you this morning. I'm David, the pastor here at Silver City Church. And a warm welcome to you because you might need it because as you can see outside, it is not warm. It is really cold. And in fact, we have had some snow, which is great. Now, I know that snow divides people more than perhaps any uh, issue or decision. So why don't you write in the comments if you're watching, are you a lover or a hater of snow? Are you someone that when it snows, you get all excited like a little seven year old kid who's desperate to get out and play with it? Or are you like one of those people that is like Ebenezer Scrooge and can't stand the snow? I'll leave it up to you. I'm not saying which one is right or wrong, but all I'm saying is that if I could be out there sledging instead of filming this, then I might be doing that. But it is snowing and snow always reminds me of one of my favourite Psalms in the Bible, Psalm 51. And snow is mentioned a few times in the Bible, but in this Psalm, uh, God just outlines to us how snow, when it falls and it beautifully covers the landscape and it covers all the dirt and the grime and the, the dirty stuff of, of outside and snow falls and it just looks pristine. That is a picture of what happens to our lives spiritually when our sin is covered by God's forgiveness and righteousness. Let me read out Psalm 51 for you this morning. And I just want to encourage you, why don't you just, if you're sitting down, if you're just in that place drinking your coffee, why don't you just take a moment and pause, just close your eyes, take a deep breath and listen to these beautiful words that are found in Psalm 51. This is what it says. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity. Cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Now listen to these beautiful verses. Cleanse me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me, but restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. It goes on a few more verses, but we're just going to pause there and we are a way to sing of God's righteousness about how great a God we have. But I wonder, just at the very birthing of this new year, 2021, this is our second Sunday, and the whole year lies ahead of us, more or less, and the potential is there. But I wonder, could there be a better thing that we start off by praying these verses? Lord, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Lord, I just pray for each and every person, each and every family watching this, that their experience today, tomorrow, throughout the course of this year, will be that you come and meet them at their point of need. And in that place, you just transform them, you change them, you give them and create in them a clean heart. That's my prayer. Let your presence go with them, Lord, wherever they go, wherever they may be. Let them know the presence of the one true living God. 
We have got so much in store this morning. It's going to be a great service. Later on, we'll hear from Pastor Ike. He's going to be continuing our Big Faith series. And we're going to hear from Douglas Talks. But before that, we are going to just, like I said, worship God by singing a song. We serve a great God. Let's stand and give him the worship he's due. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart that is broken.
We have some really exciting things kicking off shortly at Silver City Church. One of those is our new life group season. Now last year in the between August and December, we kicked off our first ever online life groups. I mean, we're doing them on Zoom and they were great. I think between 25, 30 people were coming along and we were just doing a study called the Comeback Series by Louis Giglio and it was great. It really blessed people. This year we are starting a new study and it, we are going to be following and studying this book here. Now I'll hold it up to the camera so you can see it a bit better. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry. Now this book, the tagline as you can see is how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of the modern world. It's my hunch and my experience that hurry just wrecks havoc with my life and lives of other people that I know. I think across people and across society, hurry is one of the most toxic things about our modern life and our modern lifestyle. And so over the next probably nine sessions, a fortnight apart, we are going to be taking some time to look at this book and read through it, discuss it, and implement the principles that we find in it. The book, I've been reading the book, listening to the book on audio, uh, what's it called, Audible, and the book has been challenging me more than any other book I've read in a long time. It is a book that when you read it, you feel the author almost putting into words things that you would like to describe, but maybe you just can't find the words to do that. And he points out in just little pinpoints things in your life which you're like that describes me exactly but it doesn't just leave you in that place it then shows you some principles where you can establish a healthier lifestyle one where hurry isn't the dominant factor let me read out just a little bit out the book just to give you a flavor of what type of stuff is in this it says this this really stood out to me this paragraph hurry and love are incompatible all my worst moments as a father, a husband, and a pastor, even as a human being, are when I'm in a hurry. Late for an appointment, behind on my unrealistic to-do list, trying to cram too much into my day. I ooze anger, tension, a critical nagging, the antithesis of love. If you don't believe me, next time you're trying to get your wife and three young, easily distracted children out of the house and you're running late, just pay attention to how you relate to them. Does it look and feel like love? Or is it far more in the vein of agitation, anger, a biting comment, a rough glare? Hurry and love are oil and water. They simply do not mix. As a church, I've said it 100 million times last year it felt like, we are a church that wants to love God well and we want to love other people well. And like this book is outlining, hurry and love do not mix. They are almost the opposites. And I want to encourage you. I think this book could be a game changer for you. I really do. I'm not just saying that because we bought 30 of them and they're sitting in Sheena's bedroom waiting to be sent out for free, although we have. I'm saying it because I deeply believe that the four principles found in this book are going to help change your life for the better. So please do sign up for Life Group. It is a way that you can build your relationship with God and with other people. Could it be simpler to sign up? All you need to do is follow the link that we're going to drop into the chat feed now. There's also a little button you can press called Life Groups. When you click that button, it will take you to a simple page where you can sign up for Life Group. When you sign up, we're even going to send you a copy of the book for free. There you go. You can't get any better than that. And then the course itself starts every Thursday, not every Thursday night, sorry, every second Thursday night. So it starts on Thursday, the 21st of January, and it goes from 8 p.m. till 9.15. So you're not committing yourself to hours and hours. You're only committing yourself every second Thursday on the Zoom call. And then there's a little bit of reading in between sessions. I want to encourage you to get involved because honestly, if you miss this, you will miss some of the key ingredients 
that are going to go into forming the culture of Silver City Church in the days ahead. If, if you don't grasp and, and get hold of what is taught in this book, then I believe you'll always feel a little bit out of sync with the way we do things at Silver City Church, because I feel the truth outlined in this book is going to impact us as individuals, but also as a church. This is how we are going to build our church in the coming days. So get involved, get a free book, and I'd love to see you on the Life Group call. Now talking about hurry, wouldn't it be nice to hear what patience is all about? Yes, it would. So here is Douglas Talks with our following on the gifts of the Spirit, uh, not the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit that we started last year. We did love, we did joy. Here is Douglas giving us some information and some guidance on patience. It can be so hard to be patient. Hey guys, it's me again, Douglas, and you know, we're continuing in our series on the fruit of the Spirit, and today we're talking about patience. Now, I've talked about patience before, but um, I wanted to talk to you about patience, specifically talking about how it's a fruit of the Spirit. Now, when we say a fruit of the Spirit, we mean that if you have the Holy Spirit living in your heart. If you are a Christian and you've accepted God into your life and you've given your life to him, and if you are living according to the Spirit, you're living the way God wants you to, then you're going to have patience in your life. But this can be especially challenging for kids, big time. You know, especially in our generation, we've got stuff so easy. Well, even not just easy, but fast. We've got stuff so fast. We've got, you know, you can order stuff online and it's at your door in two days or less. And, you you know, we've got microwaves and we've got Netflix and YouTube and we can just watch whatever we want whenever we want. And everything is just right at our fingertips. It's so easy to get things very, very fast. Now, as a kid, man, that's it. everything is fast. But God still wants us to be patient. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit. If you have the Spirit of God in your life, then you will be patient. And you really might be thinking to yourself, no, 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 Douglas, I cannot be patient. I literally cannot wait. I cannot be patient. You can. I want to give you that encouragement. You can be patient. Now, that might look a little bit different for some people. You know, somebody might be, you know, you might have to tap your foot or something to be patient, but you can still be patient. You can still wait. You can still enjoy the life that God has given you instead of just, you know, fussing and complaining because you're, you you can't wait for the next thing. It's got to come right now. So if you are thinking that you just cannot be patient, I want to give you this challenge. And even if you, even if you only struggle with being patient, sometimes I want to give you this challenge too. My challenge to you is that you would seek God out, that you would spend more time with God, that you would live the life that God has called you to. You would live according to the Spirit. Because if God wants you to do something, you can be sure that he'll help you to do that thing. That doesn't mean he's just going to do it for you. No, you you still have to be the one to be patient. But he can help you to be patient. Because ultimately what it comes down to, you know, sometimes, you know, we're just thinking of ourselves. We, We want what we want and we want it now. But if we can be still and we can remember that God has a plan and that that plan is good, then it can be a little bit easier for us to be patient. And again, you might be thinking... No, Douglas, it is impossible for me to be patient. Okay, maybe it is. Maybe it's impossible for you to be patient. That, that's fine. But with God, all things are possible. Everything is possible. You might say, Douglas, it is absolutely impossible for a sea to split down the middle and for people to walk through it. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's impossible. But we serve a God for whom nothing is impossible. I really hope that you will learn to be patient. And most importantly, that you would draw closer to God. Because the closer you are to God, the the better your relationship is with God, the more patient you will be able to be. So there we have Douglas knocking it out of the park as usual. Thanks, Douglas, for that. Thoughts on patience. I'm sure we'll all find them helpful. We're going to take a little moment now and do something a little bit different. And that is that we're going to stop and we are going to spend a few moments honouring someone. Now this person, I'll let you guess who it is, is someone who's really important 
and very, very special to the life here at Silver City Church. And in fact, I can't really imagine Silver City Church without this person doing what they do. Any guesses who it is? Of course, I'm sure you were all guessing, it is Sheena. Sheena Donald, who is the church administrator here at Silver City Church. But not only the church administrator, she is also my auntie. So Sheena and I have known each other for a long time. And um, it is a pleasure now that Sheena and I get to work together every single day. Well, it is a pleasure for me. I hope I'm not putting words into your mouth, Sheena. But we really get to enjoy that, just working together really since last summer, doing all the things that we've incorporated over the last months in Silver City Church. It's been great fun and a lot of hard work. But Sheena is someone who is patient, like we just heard from Douglas, who is hardworking, who is gifted, who is skilled. But the reason we're going to take a moment to honour her, especially this morning, is because this month marks 10 years since Sheena started working way back in January 2011 for Silver City Church. I mean, it wasn't called Silver City Church back then, New Life International Church. But she's been consistent all through that whole decade now of working and giving her gifting into the life of our church. Sheena, you are an absolute star. Many people will know all the things you do in the background, uh, but many people perhaps don't. Let me just say Sheena does a colossal amount of stuff behind the scenes. The, we sometimes compare ministry in a church to an iceberg and how an iceberg, one tenth of it is above the water, but nine tenths of it is below the waterline. So the bulk, the vast majority of the work goes on unseen in an iceberg below the waterline. You only see the little bit sticking out. Let me tell you, Sheena, if her church was an iceberg, Sheena is the below the waterline iceberg bit of it, if that makes sense. It's maybe not a very good analogy, but Sheena does a power of work behind the scenes, sowing life into her church. And I'm sure many of you will be well aware of that. Sheena, over the last 10 years now, you've worked alongside four different pastors, uh, believe it or not. And there are some other people now who would just like to take a moment to say thanks and to give you an encouragement. So, here we go. So, Sheena, you're 10 years old as a church administrator. And it sounds better put that way, doesn't it? Do you realise that you're, in your 10 years, you have actually served um, longer than any pastor in recent memory, including myself, which rather puts into perspective any tendency on our part to think that we're the important people. Um, you're the glue that holds us all together, um, which sounds a bit messy, but it's important. Um, I've not worked with you during that 10 years because, of course, I'd retired after you were appointed, but I've observed you and I've been blessed by you. I've observed your patience and your helpfulness and your willingness to, to give time to anyone in the church. And I've been the beneficiary of that very often and of course of your efficiency. During your 10 years, your, um, your workload has both grown more complicated and grown. Um, I would use a phrase for it that I've just invented and I'm rather proud of, um, your workload has expanded exponentially. I shall pause for applause at that point. Um, a bit like my waistband in, um, in lockdown, actually. Um, I'd go so far as to say that every church should have a Sheena. That, in fact, you put the silver in Silver City. On a more serious note, um, I see you as gifted in, in the sense of um, 1 Corinthians 12 verse 5. Um, in the King James Version, it talks about gifts of administration. And if anyone has that gift, you have it and you have it in spades. Um, but it's not just administration, is it? It's love and the way you carry out your work and your life. And so I'm wishing you in the Lord every blessing, every continued blessing, 
on yourself, your family, and your work. Um, and through that blessing, we will also continue to be blessed. So, thank you. It's such a privilege to be asked to uh, just comment on uh, Sheena's contribution to, to my time and my ministry uh, when I was in the church in Aberdeen. Um, I guess my first recollection was in 2009, we were on a, a church weekend away to Glen Shee. And um, <clears throat> it was at that time we started to start to wrestle with the call of God or the purpose of God on uh, Sheena's life. And um, Sheena was desperate to place God right at the center of that. And, and, and I clearly remember God stirring a calling in Sheena, um, which um, to this day continues. And um, that's something that has been really inspiring in terms of uh, being part of that journey with Sheena from that time, 2009, uh, in, in our weekend away in Glenshee. Sheena was, uh, is a significant enabler. Um, she facilitates so much um, of the ministry of the church and, and blessed me so much um, while, while I was there. I, I, there were so many firsts. We, I remember us um, opening the church office so that anybody in Aberdeen could contact us almost 24 7 we hired the offices in regis um, <coughs> and then we relocated the offices to um to the church at leadside road we bought the minibus um, we ventured into the school for our services but not just our services i mean i remember international evenings at the school there being three or four hundred people present and but sheena being right at the center of the organization facilitation of those sorts of evenings incredible a blessing to me and, and my family personally and i'll be forever grateful for those for those things and things like um the victus conference we launched a conference down at gartmore and uh, sheena again right at the center of, of organizing those moments and um one of the specials particularly special times was um ordaining Pastor Dave and, and Pastor Ike into the ministry at one of those conference weekends where all the logistics was organized by Sheena. Sheena enabled those moments of blessing to happen and they are significant life-changing moments and, and as I say I'm forever grateful for that. One of the things I always found that I could learn from Sheena was her empathy um, there's a verse in Proverbs which says that <laughs> like a gentle word uh, can t turn away anger. Um, Sheena would hold this sort of approach um, in everything she did. And, and um, yeah, it was, it was I, I could learn a lot. And I would learn a lot from seeing the way that she would gently, um, strongly or firmly as well, though, deal with situations. Um, but in a way that would diffuse the situation rather than see it escalate and, and relationships be maintained. And, and that was a fantastic thing to witness. Uh, Ashina, what I would say is the time, the years we had uh, together, you, you, are, you are, you were and are an inspiration um, and, and brought so much life and energy. And um, particularly, I just want to come back to this issue of um, the calling. I remember many times we would have um, a Bible sharing time at the start of the week, and uh, and I would just be blown away by the sense of calling that you felt on your life, and um, the, the surety that that gives. A couple of verses of scripture just to finish. Um, Second Timothy one four to six says this: "Recalling your tears, I long to see you, so that <coughs> I may be filled with joy." I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. And, and you know, I just want to really encourage you go from strength to strength, uh, fan into flame the gift, because there's no doubt in my mind of the sincerity of your faith and your calling. Um, so just want to say thank you so much, 
absolutely fantastic working with you and uh, have a really blessed day. Bye. Hello, Shina. Um, I just want to use this opportunity to say thank you very much. Big thank you to you for all the work, all the dedication and all that you have done in the house of the Lord over the past 10 years. Uh, today, as we celebrate your 10th anniversary in the house of the Lord, working very steadfastly, working seriously very hard behind the scenes. A lot of the beautiful, wonderful works that you do are not seen by, by most people. But we know that you put in a lot of effort, you put in a lot of hard work to make sure that the machine of God's work at our church keeps turning and it's never clogged. You are excellent. You are very good, well dedicated to your work and you never ask for anything. You never really ask for anything. That is quite amazing how good you are with your job and you never really expect anybody to say anything or to thank you. But I want to use this opportunity to say a big, big thank you and appreciation for all the wonderful work that you do. Most especially, I want to thank you for the many years of service uh, from all the many times I've, for, the, uh, for the long time I've known you, from the time I worked together with you in the management team uh, to the time of my um, work with you as an elder in the church and even now as a pastor of, of, of the church as well. So I thank you for all the support you've given me over the years. And I would like to pray for you, but I'll use this scripture in the book of Isaiah to, to pray for you. Um, two scriptures. One is from the book of uh, Isaiah chapter 26 verse 3, I will read the um, amplified version of that of that scripture. It says, You will guard him, her, and keep him, a shina, in perfect and constant peace, whose mind, both his inclination and his character, is stayed on you, because she, shina, commits herself to you, leans on you, and hopes confidently in you. This is, this is a true reflection of your character, Shina, and uh, I pray this prayer for you today. And another prayer I'll pray for you as well, as you continue with your work and with your journey in the house of the Lord, is uh, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 28, uh, verse 30 to 31. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fail, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagle. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not finish. So, Shina, as you continue into more years of service in the house of the Lord, you will walk and you will run and you will not be weary. You will stay strong all the days of your life. In Jesus' name, Amen. Hi, Shina. Hi, Shina. Just wanted to say it was uh, our privilege pleasure and honour to work with you for the four and a half years that we were there uh, in Aberdeen. Yeah, actually I really don't know how I feel about celebrating 10 years no. because we've been sitting thinking it must be about 14 or 15 if years you, of work that yeah, you've done. Yeah, you count the hours you've put in, it's <laughs> definitely a lot more than yeah. 10 years love. Yeah. Um, you were amazing, you've been yeah. brilliant and I think probably we realise it more um, since we've left and uh, we just Oh, you just went beyond what was needed. Above so and needed. beyond. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, you were such a blessing to us, to the church. Um, and I know you'll continue to do that yeah. because that's your yeah. heart. Um, but we're just uh, taking this time out as uh, the people of God to honour you and to say thank you. Mm. Um, thank you for your gifting that you use so freely for church um, above and beyond. Yeah. And the Bible speaks about administration being a gift. Mm. And you have that in super abundance. Efficient, and excellent, patient, with good grace and a great sense of humour. Yes. <laughs> I still remember the laughs that we had many a day. Uh, and they probably laughed more than we got some work done, to be honest. But uh, yeah, we miss you guys. Sheena, I said it to your face uh, when we were there. You are worth your weight in gold and more. We thank God for you. Yeah. God bless you. God bless you. Sheena, I'm delighted to learn that Silver City Church is honouring you, yes you, this weekend celebrating 10 years of faithful, joyful service up there in Aberdeen. I think of the Thessalonians when Paul congratulated and honoured them for their 
work of faith, their labour of love, their steadfastness of hope. And you know, during this pandemic, through and during this time, we haven't been able to physically gather to worship and sing in song. But you know, and I know that that's not what worship is about. Worship is about giving your whole life as a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God. And you have shown, you've continued to worship God for 10 years and it sure ain't stopped these last 10 months. Go on shining, we thank God for you. I know you're not asking for this, it's in your very nature. Don't cringe though, say thank you Lord. Thank you Lord for the favour that you've shown me, for the love of God's people for me, and for all that you have for me in the next 10 years. God bless you Sheena. Hi Sheena, it's uh, such a privilege for me to be able to join with so many today in celebrating your life in ministry and honouring you for all that you have done there in Aberdeen and on behalf of the Apostolic Church UK, uh, we really appreciate uh, the work that goes on behind the scenes and there is so much to do and so much that um, uh, other people are just totally unaware of but you are completely aware of and um, you have your finger right on the pulse of the local church and uh, and it's beating the heart of that church is beating well because of your ministry and so we love you we appreciate you we honor you today god bless you sheena bye bye I really hope you've been blessed by those words, Sheena. It's a small gesture really to let you know how much we value you, how much we appreciate you. It's probably goes without saying, but a role like yours, which is often behind the scenes, um, we can easily forget to say thank you and to forget to say how much we value the job that you do and the way you do it. And so today we're just taking a little moment to say thanks. Thank you for the last 10 years. And hey, we're looking forward to the next 10 years to see what God has in store for you and for our church. So we are now here from Pastor Ike, who is continuing our theme, Big Faith. And today Ike is talking to us about big faith of a changed heart. Here's Ike. Hello church and good morning everybody. Um, it's a new year, it's a brand new year and I wish you, your family, your friends and everybody a happy new year. 2020, 2020 has come and gone. This is the second week of 2021 and we thank God that we made it into 2021 and I know that 2021 is going to be a great year. 2021 is going to be a beautiful year. 2021 is going to be a prosperous year for you and your family. And 2021 is going to be a great year for all of us. So I thank God that we made it into 2021. And I'm excited and expectant and looking forward to the great things that the Lord has in store for you, for your friends, for your family, for our nation, for our city and for each and every one of us. We come into the presence of the Lord this year excited. We come looking forward and launching into victory because the Bible has said that the Lord is a good God. And the Lord is here to prosper us in 2020, to give us good health, to look after us, and to watch over us. No matter what is going on around us, we know that God is with us and he's going to continue to be with us in this year. So, um, thank you for tuning in today. We're going to look and continue our series on Big Faith. During the first installment, uh, which I spoke on last year, we looked at the faith of Abraham. Abraham, we reckon and we recognize as a man of faith. The Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So during that installment, 
we discovered that faith, the faith of Abraham wasn't a one-time event. The faith of Abraham was driven by the promises, so many promises that God made to him over a period of time. Not just one promise, not two promises, but a series of promises that God made to Abraham over a period of time. And Abraham believed God and journeyed with God and God fulfilled those promises as Abraham exercised his faith along the journey and along the way. So we concluded that series uh, with the understanding that Abraham's faith was driven by the promises of God and that faith was anchored, founded, based on the promises that God made to Abraham over a period of time. So today, as we look into the second installment of this series on big faith, what I'm going to be talking about today is something uh, that um, another dimension of faith, the dimension of faith that I would uh, describe as perhaps the biggest the biggest faith the faith of a changed heart the biggest faith is the cha- the faith of a changed heart a lot of us believers in Christ Jesus Christ take it for granted that it takes a lot of effort to change heart it takes a lot of effort to change mind it takes a lot of effort to stop believing something and start believing another thing. It takes a lot of effort and it takes a lot of commitment to all of a sudden realize that all the things you hold there and all the things you thought were right were not actually the way they are. It takes a lot of faith to both salvation. It takes a lot of faith to bring about salvation in someone's life. Take an eight taste that eventually turns to Christ. Take someone, for example, like Apostle Paul, who was a very, very strong persecutor of Christians. He never wanted to hear anything about Christ. But when his mind was changed and he became a believer, he became one of the most zealous Christians to have ever lived, a prolific writer of the gospel. He became one of the strongest, staunchest, prudent defenders of the gospel of Christ as we know it today. So, what I would like to talk about today is actually how Jesus Christ illustrated that faith through a parable he spoke about in the book of Luke. And I would like us to turn to the book of Luke, chapter 15. And I will, before we read it, though, I would like us to pray. So as you get your Bible, and if you close your eyes, and we shall pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The Bible says that the entrance of your word brings light. Father, may your word that we hear today be mixed with faith to revive our hearts, to change hearts, to change minds. May your words that we hear today bring clarity to our minds. May your words, Lord, that we hear today open our eyes to see the greatness in your truth, Lord, 
the simplicity of your word. Lord, may your words that we hear today be so simple that it will be so simple for our minds, simple minds to understand. Lord, I pray today that your Holy Spirit will touch every heart and every mind and every soul that hears your word today coming out of my mouth to mix it with faith. Because the Bible says that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. May every person that hears your word today listen and obey it. For those who are saved, that their faith will be strengthened. For those who are seeking salvation, that the world be so simple to their minds to convict them of their need for you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So, if you've got your Bible and you've opened to Luke chapter 15, I would like to start reading from verse 11. And I, I read, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The youngest son said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the youngest son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his field to, field to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare, and here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But his father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him, what was going on? Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother came, became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and, ple and pleaded with him. 
But he answered his father, Look, all these years I have been serving, I have been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. You never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes came home, you killed the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But, but we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Father, thank you for your word. I would like to start by saying that a lot of people have spoken about this parable of the lost son, and there's been a lot of teachings gone out about it as well. But what the Lord is speaking to me about or presenting to me to speak to us about today is to look at an aspect of this story that may not have been spoken so much about. It is about the faith of the prodigal son, of the son who left. And you will ask me, what faith did he have? He misused his father's wealth. He was so impatient. As tradition would have it, we know that he would not have been entitled to his inheritance until after his father's death. But he was such in a hurry that he went to his father and asked for his own share of inheritance. And his father obliged him. His father gave it to him. His father allowed him to go and to do what he wanted to do. He knew that the son had a free will, just like you and I, God has given us free will to choose right from wrong. He did not try to cajole him. He did not become angry at his request. He simply obliged. The son went away. He lived the Bible says a riotous life, he squandered the money, and in no time, he fell into difficulty. He fell into problems. That was when he remembered that he had options. He had options. He should not be living as a slave as a servant, because he is a son after all. And you are a son of God. God made you in his own image. God has given you the same privileges that this son has. And one thing I can say today that also touched me or I picked up from this scripture that I have not previously heard in several messages I've heard on this, on this scripture in the past is that this son may have grown up in a family that knew Christ. Well, in the Jewish tradition as it were in those days, he would have known his tradition. He would have known the tradition of the family. He would have known how things are done. But he was not happy, so he left the house and decided to go to a far country where he would be away from the laws, from the traditions of his people. And if you are today listening to me, and you were once a believer, you grew up in a church, you've made Christ at some point in your life, 
your personal Lord and Savior, and you have, for some reason, backslidden or gone away. I bring you good news today. I bring you good news that you can come back. Where you are is not where you're supposed to be. You don't have to get to the end of the rope to realize that the door is always wide open for you to come back. The door is always wide open and the Father's arm is all stretched out to welcome you. That's what this story is all about. The son fell into difficulty and he realized that he had better options. Does it have to get to that stage for our minds to be changed? Do we have to leave the house where we had comfort, where we had everything for us to change our mind? That after all, our father's love, our family's affections are so strong, they cannot be compared to that which we see outside somewhere else. That is what happened to this son. You know, I became curious and I tried to find out why nobody told us how old this man was before he went to his father and how long he was before he squandered all his wealth. Those questions will remain unknown to us, at least for now. But one thing we know is that he was old enough. He was old enough to realize that he is entitled to some portion of his father's wealth. So he went to his father and he got the wealth. So listening to me today, you would be entitled to a portion of God's wealth, to a portion of God's love, to a portion of God's, under, to a portion of God's um, love and affection. But have you squandered it? Have you gone to, come to a place where you have realized that you need to change your mind? You need to realize that you've made a mistake and that you need to go back to your father. So when this son realized that he made a mistake and he was about to change his mind, he rehearsed three things. He rehearsed three things that he wanted to go back to his father when he was ready to go back to his father. The first thing is that he was going to go to his father and if we look at... Um, Verse um, 17, the Bible says that he came to his senses and he said, How many of my father's higher servants have food enough to spare? And I'm starving of death to death. I will set out and go back to my father in verse 18 and say to him, Three things he wanted to say to his father Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the third thing is make me one of your hired servants. That comes from a repentant heart. That comes from a heart that has realized that they need something bigger, higher than they currently have. But God is merciful. He changed his mind, and on the process, on the way going, his father saw him and ran to him. And the son started on his rehearsed speech, and he was only able to utter the first two, two of those. Yeah, he told his father that he has sinned against him. He told his father that he's no longer worthy to be called his son. But his father did not let him 
said the third one, which is, make me a higher servant. Make me a slave. Make me your servant. No. His father realizes that there is no substitution to being a son. Once a son, you are always a son. You cannot be demoted. You, your position cannot degrade. So the father did not allow him that opportunity to make the thought statement because he knows that a son is always a son. And today, I bring you good news. You are a son of God. You may have fallen away. You may have been in church. You may have backslidden. In fact, I'll tell you a story that, uh, you know, my wife told me yesterday about uh, one of her colleagues. Um, she told me that this guy has always known her to be a believer. So she came to him, or so he came to her and said to, 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 to Anna, um, I know you're a born again Christian. And he went on to talk to her about uh, faith and his attitude about faith. And as they got into talking, he said, well, I used to be a believer. I used to be born again. That was a long time ago. I don't go to church anymore. I don't believe anymore. So, um, well, by the way, the Bible, do you really think the Bible is real? Do you think the Bible is true? Do you think that it wasn't just written by anybody else? So, uh, knowing my wife and how strongly she uh, loves the Word of God and the Bible and um, um, we give everything to uh, defend it to the last minute, so she went into discussion with this man and kind of uh, came to the conclusion that the man is seeking. And uh, he prayed. He prayed with. He prayed for for him and promised to uh, give him some materials that will uh, open his eyes to see certain things. So you see, that is why I believe it is one of the hardest things for people who are away from God to realize that they've come to the end of the rope. They've come to that stage where they need to make that decision and come to Christ. That is one of the hardest things to do. But that is, once you've made that switch, once you've made that turn, that is the biggest faith. That is the biggest leap in faith anybody can have is to believe, to come to Christ, to realize that Christ is everything. It's not easy. It's difficult. And if you're a believer today, thank God you are. Don't take it for granted. If somebody else is an unbeliever, show compassion to him. Don't be like the brother who thought, oh, I've been here, I've served you. It may, have been so easy for, it may have been so easy for him, but it hasn't been easy for his younger brother. And being in the house, we have a lot of privileges. And we should show a lot of compassion, just like the father did, to people outside, to people outside the house, or people who have been in the house, and walked away. Let us remember them in this 2021. Let us remember them as we move forward throughout this year and realize that what we have, we may have taken for granted because we've had faith for a long time over a period of, over a period of years, maybe months, that somebody who has lost his or somebody who has strayed out of faith, or somebody who has not even come out of come into faith in the first place, may be or is in a very, very difficult place. And it takes a lot of effort. It takes the strongest, the, 
biggest faith to turn that ship around. And my prayer tonight, or my prayer today, is that we would have compassion on these people. We will go out of our way to try to work with them, to get them to realize again, to come to their senses, to get them to see that Christ is always there with an open hand to embrace, to welcome, to celebrate them when they come back. So let, it, let us make it our mission this year to seek out in our various walks of lives, in our various areas of influence, people that we can impact with the gospel of Jesus Christ. People we can speak to openly and freely about what we have that is so dear to us that they will come to the realization that it is also for them. Before I finish today, I would like to uh, read one of the uh, um, one of the quotes I got from my study of BSF uh, some time ago that has actually um, touched my life, and I would like to share it with you in concluding. And it says, "Faith in God is more than a general sense." that everything will turn out well. God leads us to trust specific truths in specific ways. Faith in God is more than a general sense that, every, that everything will turn out well. Everything did not turn out well for this prodigal son, but eventually he realized that he has missed the mark. And it took faith to change his mind and bring him back to his father. Let us pray. Father, I pray that your word that we have heard today will lead us to people around us, that you begin to open our eyes to see people around us who need help, and be able to offer them the help that they need in you to change their minds, develop faith, and come back to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, Ike, for sharing with us this morning. That was really wonderful. The line that I really loved was this line, once a son, always a son. And similarly, once a daughter, always a daughter of God. And what an encouragement that is for us, for you perhaps this morning, maybe you just need to hear that, that once you are a son, a daughter of God, you are always a son and daughter of God. He welcomes you back. There's times when we all need to turn away from something. Remember last year we talked about repenting, turning away from our sin, turning towards Jesus. And what Ike showed us so clearly today is that when we turn, we don't see a God who is pushing us away. We see a God with arms open wide, running towards us to embrace us. Thanks for that reminder, Ike. That was really timely. We're just going to wind things up now it's been a really great service we packed a lot in so apologies if we've overran slightly but just look ahead into the week please remember life group please sign up and also alpha we'll be pushing alpha a little bit on social media during the week and i really encourage you please think about who you can invite to our next online alpha course starting on tuesday the 19th of january we did it last year for the first time it worked brilliantly and i just like to encourage you, make sure you invite at least one person. Might be a work colleague, a family member, next door neighbor, your mechanic, whoever it is that God puts in your heart, send out an invitation. I'll be giving you some steps on how you can do that really simply in the coming week. But start to think about who you can invite. 
all that that invitation is, is an opportunity for someone to take a step closer to God. Now they might not take it, but hey, they definitely won't take it if they don't get the opportunity. So that's what this is all about, giving people an opportunity. Let me just pray to finish our time together this morning. Lord, we want to thank you for the opportunity to come together, even if it is only online at the moment. We thank you that that bond that we have as a church family is spiritual. And even though we're not together physically, we know that we have a bond together and we share the love with one another because you have shared your love into our hearts. I want to pray for each and every family, each and every individual watching this, Lord, that your blessing would be on them as they go into the week ahead, Lord. Let them remember that once a son, once a daughter, always a son and always a daughter. I just pray for everyone that may need to turn away from something, something sinful, something negative in their lives and turn back to you. Holy Spirit, won't you give them the grace right now in this moment to do that? In Jesus' name we pray. Have a great week, everyone. Stay safe and enjoy some sledging, hopefully. See you soon.